Greetings, thanks for joining me, it's Fred in Alaska. Um, let's see, uh, coming up on the 10th, I'm going to be on um, on with Doug Hycheck. I, I forget the name of his podcast, but when I find out, I'll, I'll put it in this video description at some point here. Um, anyway, so what I wanted to share with you today comes from Douglas. He's a pilot who used to fly charters. And he was in, I believe it was a Chieftain little twin engine, little eight-seater. And he was on his way between a couple villages. And as was so happened, he was up near the Salter River. And one of his engines had some issues with some pressure. And it made him real nervous real fast. And so he radioed to the you know people he needed to and gave him the coordinates. I'm landing here at this airstrip, which happened to be at Caribou Creek. Uh, there's there's a landing strip there and whatnot. So he comes down in between the, uh, I don't know if they're technically mountains, but, you know, he came down and he realized the wind direction's wrong way, so he had to climb back up, circle around, and come back down, and he lands, right? He ends up to the south side of this long-ass runway. And so he's waiting for the cavalry, uh, basically a, a mechanic and another another person to come out and help him with these issues because of how quickly the pressure drop was he was worried about some things and stuff and so by protocol or whatever he had to you know put it down uh he felt he could have flown the rest of the way or whatever but because he radioed it and all that they they had him put down immediately it wasn't his craft so he had to abide so anyway douglas is at the end of this the south end of this airstrip and you know, this this happened actually, uh, gosh, it, it was back in the 80s. However, it was roughly this time of year. Um, there, it was broken up snow. It was freeze-thaw cycle type thing. So when he came into land, it was real rough. You know, it wasn't very well groomed. So when he taxied down to the south end of this runway, he circles around, kills engines and stuff. And, I mean, you know, you know he had provisions, you know, survival provisions in case, just in case, you know what I mean? He had a little survival gun with a 41022, you know, the it breaks in half, you put the two rounds in or whatever. And you know, he had some freeze-dried stuff. And so he's sitting there and and he knows he's got, you know, probably a handful of hours before the cavalry arrives, so to speak. So uh, this was roughly mid-morning when he landed. So after he just kind of leaned back and kind of fell asleep for a couple hours. And he said it was the damnedest thing. He he was just like startled awake and doesn't know why. And he's immediately looking around and realized, okay, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting. He's checking time. And as he's looking around the aircraft and everything, he, he's at a little bit of an angle. Not much, but a little bit. Now, um just because of how he parked these these chieftains actually sit pretty damn level but how he was parked and he's looking up the runway and he notices this dark spot just just barely coming into view and it crosses the runway and he goes ah oh, spring bear you know that was a pretty damn big black bear for the distance i'm at you know he was at a few hundred feet from this thing and he's like, that was pretty damn big. But again, he was just waking up and he was not expecting any kind of craziness at all. So he says he was sitting there and nature calls, right? So he hops out. He's looking around, you know, he's looking at the ground. He walks directly off to his left. He's facing north. He walks off to his left into the brush and, you know, handles his call to nature. He comes back out and he, he climbs back up. He's just standing there and he's looking around, you know, he's just like getting some fresh air, stretching a little bit. And he's looking due south and he's thinking, come on, guys, let's, you know, let's get here. Let's get this done. Let me get out of here, whatever. Get me out of here, whatever. Because he, he said there were several times he just thought about just flying to his destination and taking care of it from there. But 
he, you know, he had already had a couple of issues before and he didn't want to get fired. So it's basically what it boiled down to, right? Now, um, as he was standing up there and he's looking around, he was like, oh yeah, that bear. And so he's looking, nothing, nothing. He's like, eh, oh well, maybe it'll pop out, you know, or something like that. So he gets back inside and he's just sitting there chilling, leaning back. And he was contemplating taking off getting up to altitude and radioing to see how far away they were. But because of this pressure drop, he felt that trying to take off with just the single engine and stuff, he could probably do it. But then again, he's risking someone else's equipment. So he's like, screw it. I, I'll just be patient. Just be patient. So he quasi starts to drift off again and he hears a weird noise. And he's when he, when he opens his eyes and he's looking straight up the runway again, He's not seeing anything, and he kind of turns his gaze, you know, working to the right. About 65 yards across the little runway from him, up into some trees, he notices movement. And he's like, well, that's, and he was hearing this weird, gruffy kind of grunting noise. And he, he said it was the damnedest thing because he had never heard anything quite that loud. Uh, he's heard bear grunts. But nothing as loud as what was happening over this direction. It, 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 it was like he saw the movement and he was like, man, it, just something off about it. So he kept watching and watching it. And this thing was slowly, very slowly and methodically, just barely out of view. He's just catching glimpse of this thing moving along. And it gets almost parallel with them. Not quite, but almost parallel with them. And so he's like, man, what is that? And he had a small pair of binoculars, so he grabs those. He steps out on the opposite side, uh, so he had basically wing and everything between him and this bear, uh, so he could duck back in if this thing charged or whatever. But he wanted to get a better look, so he's he's outside, he shuts the door, and he's leaning over the top, and he's using these binoculars. Douglas said it was the weirdest thing when he put binoculars on this thing, it stopped moving. It, he said it stopped moving, and all he could see was just the faintest bit of of hair behind some alders and he said it was about he's guessing about four to six inches long and the way it was moving in the little breeze and stuff but it, the figure itself wasn't moving and he's like weird so he lowered the binoculars and it started moving again so he put binoculars up and all of a sudden there was no movement he said he did that about five or six times over the course of about three to four minutes and finally he just hung he let the binoculars hang around his neck and he's just watching he was like, for whatever reason, this bear is, anytime I'm putting up binoculars, there's no movement. So he, he decides, I'll let it get out in the open, then I'll put some binoculars on it. Mm. So as he's standing there, he hears planes off in the distance. So he's like, oh, great, that might be the cavalry. And so he stops paying attention to this bear for a minute, and he's kind of looking to see if they're coming in, you know, and they weren't, they were just flying by, you know, just a little bush plane. He's like, dang it. And so he goes, oh yeah, the bear. So he turns and looks, and there's this thing standing there, staring at him. He said it appeared to be about nine foot tall, uh, kind of skinny, uh, and it was uh, doing a very slight sway back and forth, almost like it was trying to, trying to get a better look at him. And he's looking across at it. And at this point, the sun is actually in his favor of seeing this thing. He said the skin was very, very dark, uh, not quite black, uh, almost like a uh, very, very dark gray, uh, wet cement I threw out as an option. He said it was a little darker than that, so a little darker than wet cement. And he said the the thing about it that stood out, because he's not using the binoculars, he's his naked eye, he's looking at this thing, he said this thing was blinking real fast. And so that's when he put up the binoculars and this thing, as soon as he got the binoculars to his face, he turned around and walked immediately off into the brush, right? Right out of view again. And so he was like, what the hell did I just see? So he he's forgetting himself for a moment that he's actually outside of the plane and it dawns on him, well, that thing is huge. I want to get in. I'm going to get back in the plane. He opens up the door and he, he climbs in. He said, as soon as he was reaching up to shut the door... A scream came from that thing that was just inside the brush that he felt in the plane at roughly 60-ish yards. And he said he had never been so scared in his life. Uh, he said that he was so intimidated that 
even the thought of grabbing that little survival gun wasn't an option. His whole world got real small real fast inside this plane as he's sitting there going, I'm going to fly out of here, right? And so he's doing his pre-flight and all this stuff, right? And, and, and he's like, oh man, I, I, you know, I don't know what the hell is going on here, but I don't want to be anywhere near this thing. So against his better judgment and basically that fight or flight, he fires up. Well, when he fires up, that the engine that lost all the pressure didn't seem to be doing so bad. So he was like, maybe it was an overheating issue or whatever. He, he's rationalizing all this stuff, but he's it's operating just fine. So he taxis out and he's checking the windage and everything. And as he's gearing up, like throttling down to take off, he said from the same area it was at, it ran, and he's he's starting to get moving. You know, he's got twin prop. This thing took off running and wasn't trying to pace him. It was almost like it was quartering in front of him, and he's like, he didn't want to slow down. He wanted to take off, but he didn't want to run into this thing. And he said as he was going down the runway, this thing just all of a sudden was going one speed and then went to a whole different gear and was just gone. <sighs> Like, uh, he, he said it was the most unreal speed he had ever seen. So this thing takes off. Uh, he's he's kind of watching, but he's conscious of the fact that he's in an airplane ripping down this runway for a takeoff. And so he, he takes off. He gains some elevation. He climbs out over Caribou Creek. He banks off to the right. He gains some more altitude, comes back. And he said... That that took a, a, less than a handful of minutes to do the maneuver he did, right? And he said as he was coming back, this thing had, uh, he saw it up over the hill moving. He saw the brush and everything tearing. This thing, from what he could tell, it went in a straight line from where he saw it. And it was quasi pacing him, but actually quartering away. He said it looked like a straight line and this thing was moving. So he circled around. He was trying to kind of follow it and he's getting on the radio you know he's he's calling his people and you know trying to see where they were at or whatever and he's trying to get anyone near the area to come and witness it with him right because he had no recording devices or anything like that he he was trying to get someone to co-sign co-witness what he was dealing with and he said he followed it for a little bit and then hit this one little ravine and poof it, it was gone uh, he said he didn't know it, it how it could have disappeared because uh, its size and the size of the brush and stuff but it was gone poof so he circled a couple times and then the pressure problem happened again so in that time he was calling around uh his people weren't that far away so he decided okay this thing ran off i'm gonna re-land and you know since they're expecting me to be there anyway and even though they heard me on the radio uh, so he ended up getting into some trouble uh, just for taking that action in the plane. But when he explained it to the guys that showed up, one of them was his direct boss. Uh, they just kind of looked at him and realized, oh, he's obviously pale and, you know, something's up. He takes him over to where he saw it and they found one track. And he said that track was about 18 inches long and about seven inches wide at the heel. That's a, that's pretty freaking wide. Uh, and once they saw that, they were just like, holy, you know, crap. So they did their thing or whatever. Well, the plane they came in, uh, I believe it was a stall, uh, 185. Uh, he said the mechanic was doing his thing. There was an issue he had knew, known about with this particular engine and tended to it because he knew what it was when he heard, you know, over the radio and everything. He's like, ah, okay, I, I, I think I know the issue. So he's doing his thing while the other two are sitting in the plane talking and he's telling his direct boss, you know, what he dealt with, the scream, all of it, right? And so now now this is what Douglas shared with me. Uh, he shared with me that his direct boss, uh, who was doing a charter flight some years before, uh, they were they were taking some high school kids to basketball games somewhere off the Kuskokwim River. And he said they saw one out in the open tundra, and it was about quarter mile from the tree line. And this thing took off so fast because he was sharing, you know, how quickly this thing freaking shifted gears and, and booked out of there. 
And he said this thing moved so fast. Once it started moving, all they could see was snow flying. And then, you know, it hit the tree line and, and disappeared. Um, I don't know how many pilots have, have had these kind of experiences. I, I want to thank Douglas for reaching out. He no longer lives in Alaska. He's somewhere down in Minnesota, still flying, but, you know, doing different stuff. But I want to thank him for sharing that. Um, for a lot of professionals, it's really difficult to share these things because of the the bullshit ridicule the the mockery um you know things of this nature but uh i definitely appreciate you reaching out doug again you're free to respond to the comments just realize you're you'll be doxing yourself and that's up that's totally up to you um and i want to thank you and i want to thank you guys for joining me and we will we'll catch you guys on the next one. Uh, he has some more experiences that I'll be sharing at another time. We just didn't have a whole lot of time to get all of the experiences that he's dealt with over the years flying and stuff up here. But uh, as soon as I do, I'll come back on and uh, share those. So thank you guys for joining me and we'll catch you on the next one.